All right. Welcome, everybody. We are so glad that you could be a part of our rocket recovery program and webinar. I do want to welcome Frank Noble, as many of you already know. He is our First Nations Launch Technical Assistant. Joining him this evening is Bill Bertoldi. Bill Bertoldi uh, is a former First Nations Launch Assistant. He was our FNL Safety Officer for many years, and he represents Michigan Tripoli Prefecture. So um, I am greatly excited to have Bill back with us uh, to be able to present this topic and looking forward to learning more about rocket recovery. And so without any further ado, welcome Bill and welcome Frank. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Chris. Let's go over the uh, workshop uh, overview. Uh, we're going to be going over the uh, recovery cord, uh, the harnesses, parachutes, ejection lighter canisters, shear pins, prepping the rocket, and tracking your rocket. The recovery cord. The recovery cord length is very important. The length of each recovery cord should be at least three to five times the length of the rocket. And for the drogue, two to three times double the length of the airframe for the main chute at a minimum. Uh, you have link placements uh, on the recovery cord uh, connected to, connect to the nose cone in the payload section and connected to the eBay on the booster section. Uh, one third of the length of the cord is generally for the parachute uh, hookup and, and shoot protector. Two thirds, the rest of the length of the cord is uh, connected to the booster section and the eBay in the payload section. Next slide, number six. Uh, the end quick link attachment, uh, number one uh, photo above shows the wrap recovery cord around itself uh, four to five times. This is your typical uh, fishing line uh, knot, actually. Um, Photo number two, uh, just pull the end of the cord through the hole by the quick link. And photo number three shows the uh, uh, pull the end of the cord through the new hole to the top of the loop and, and cinch the knot. On uh, slide seven, you have the quick link attachment. Slide the knot forward to the quick link. This is a modified fishing knot that will continue to tighten with use if you've ever gone fishing. Uh, wrap electrical tape around the knot. Taping the knot can keep it from untying, which shows on the uh, right-hand photo. Uh, it's a good way if you can't, uh, if you have a hard time trying to even tie this uh, fishing line knot, just a regular couple of square knots and wrapping the tail end of the knot with the electrical tape will uh, hold the knot pretty secure. But always inspect your knots after flight. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Next one. You can, for the additional one, you can just loop the knot over and pull it. So you get a loop in the cord or put the, the quick link in between two cords and just tie like a granny knot on it, it'll hold it in place. The other thing I wanted to point out is when Frank said to go to the five lengths, remember Richard Bong has trees 50 and 60 feet up in the air. The longer the cord, the greater the chance you're gonna have to recover it with a pole should you end up in a tree. And that's kind of important to remember. Then we're going to harnesses. When you, when you have harnesses and you're gonna be putting them in with rocks, you guys are flying with four inches in diameter and a 54 motor tube. Put, if you're using eye bolts to attach it, you have to be very careful with the eye bolts and the placements. Because if you're not, you're not gonna be able to attach your harness into it using the quick links. So let's we can go on to the next picture. These are showing you the different types of harness straps. You can use tubular nylon. A one inch piece will, has a breaking strength of 4,000 pounds. They melt at a high temperature of 380. They're easy to tie and untie. Kevlar is heat resistant. And so you, you don't have to be concerned about your cord break or your cord burning. And nylon flat lubbing, if it's the 0.75 inches wide, that's a tensile strain of 3,800 pounds. It has a moderate heat resistance 
but you need to make sure you inspect that after yeast usage to make sure it's not burned. Okay. When you're putting the bolt placements in, if you go at 90 degrees to the body tube, with the motors you're gonna be using in the 1760s, the eye bolt's gonna overhang the motor tube. You're not gonna be able to insert a motor tube into it because the eye bolt's gonna be in the way of it. If you look at the next picture, where if you run it parallel to the motor tube and parallel to the body tube, the problem you're gonna run into with a quick link is there's not gonna be enough overlap to be able to put the quick link around it and you won't be able to hook it on. If we go to the next one, if you angle it like shown in here, on your angle, you'll be able to put a quick link around it and be able to take it on and off. You should probably do it the way it's shown here where it's in the motor tube. The angle was adjusted by putting the top of the body tube, not going far down so that I could test and slide to make sure I was at the right angle for the eye bolt to go into. So you wanna test that before you glue in your motor tube to make sure that it fits in correctly. If the, the other, I'll finish up the harnesses, Frank, then we'll have you go. Another way you can do it is to glue in the harness. And that way you have no eye bolts and you don't have to worry about those problems. The way, the way you're gonna do that is you take a Dremel and you're gonna cut a slot 180 degrees apart from each side. You wanna cut it so that the shock cord fits right into it and not much bigger than that. So if you look at the right hand picture, you'll see the cord has been pulled into it. It fits level with the tube and then do a test fit and make sure it fits and slides on and hold it the way it's shown in the picture where it's pulled in tight because you have to have that way in order to be able to slide it over the, the motor tube. Okay. The motor tube has to be sanded. You're gonna run the two cords down straight. Normally I would tie a knot at the end of the cord so that if your glue would ever let loose, the knot would hold it into the slot. You're gonna run a glue line all the way down on each side where the cord is. Then you're gonna take over it and you're gonna wrap it with electrical tape. Electrical tape's good to use because epoxy does not stick to electrical tape, so you can easily pull it off. The other thing you're gonna have to be aware of when you put this into your motor tube, the motor tube in your body, do not let the cord line up with the fin slots. It's gonna be impossible to put your fins on and glue them in place correctly and have them stay if you're doing it over the shock cord. So that's really important when you put it into the body tube of the rocket. All right, if we can go to the next one. If you'll take a look, you'll see you're gonna have a, a feature which is gonna look like the one on the left-hand side. Make sure you put epoxy around the ring in between the, the centering ring and the body tube on the top and on the bottom. And when you get done, you should have a cord which is looks similar to the one on the right where it will go. You can pull up on two sides with the cord. You're gonna tie a knot on the top of it so you have a loop on the end. When you, before you put it into your body tube, make sure that you stick it into the motor tube so the cord is out of the way. Thank you, Bill. So I'll move on to the uh, parachutes. Slide 19. Uh, parachute descent rate guide. Uh, very few uh, shoot manufacturers do show this. You have to actually email them to get this. Uh, this particular uh, company here advertises the uh, descent rate on the size of uh, the weight of the rocket and the size of shoot you should use on it. And this is on a standard shoot that they make which is probably like one of these here, standard shoe. Uh, as you can see, they make uh, several different sizes. Also, they make thin mill type shoots. If you have a small uh, parachute section in the payload and you want a larger shoot in it for uh, an easy recovery when the main comes out. Uh, the next uh, slide shows the descent rate of an X type shoot um, on the, uh, the weight of the rocket and the size of the chute that is recommended for the uh, uh, for the descent rate, and these these rates are these rates are generally five to twenty miles an hour, depending on wind direction, wind velocity per second. Sorry, uh, folding the parachute, uh, fold the chute in half as it shows. You have a uh, a four shrouded parachute. If you have like a six or eight shrouded, uh, use the same step. Fold the chute in half, which is shown on the right. 
slide 22, uh, fold it in half again, and in the same direction as shown on the left. It can be folded in half again if needed, depending on the size of the chute and what, uh, uh, where you have to put it in, as shown in the right. Slide 23, uh, pull the chute cords to the top of the chute very gently and return it to the bottom, making a almost like an, uh, a loop on top of the uh, parachute. Uh, leave extra cord below the bottom of the chute as shown on the left side. Roll from, roll from the top of the chute to the bottom, uh, probably um, in, a, in a burrito type uh, manner. Attach the bottom cord to the quick link. The chute cord will pull open and the chute will be deployed as soon as you pull it open. Next one, 24. Uh, most important, um, I have to stress how much a, a parachute is not a inexpensive item. Uh, they range from anywhere from 20 to $300. And it's a good idea to get a chute protector for all your chutes. Uh, Cause it, uh, of course it's uh, uh, made out of nylon and it is uh, very subject to uh, burning. Uh, take the side of the protector without the uh, quick link and pull it into the top of the chute as shown on the left hand side. Do the same thing, do a half like burrito wrap on it, roll the protector up like, like it's a burrito. The chute is now ready to go into the rocket. Uh, by the way, besides attaching the chute to the two thirds of the length of the shock cord or the uh, um, recovery cord, uh, the, the chute protector is hooked with the, uh, a, um, either a, a knot loop in the uh, cord or a, a, a quick link along with the chute. Ejection lighters. Uh, we call them ejection lighters because that's how they sell them. They sell them as lighters. They don't call them ejection uh, uh, explosive devices or ejection uh, uh, deployments. They call them ejection lighters. Typically a standard, uh, a standard 200 pounds of force is recommended to eject parachutes out of any uh, airframe and uh, recover each other's from the sustainer section. Uh, this is a recommended pounds per, per inch. Uh, there are several formulas to calculate this amount of black powder in grams and there's techniques to uh, contain the pyrotechnic canisters. Uh, please uh, observe this, this uh, website link. It's very informative. It's got a lot of math in it, but as always, ground test your recovery systems and the uh, recovering package must be totally deployed out of the parachute plus the recovery cord. Slide 27, ejection lighter placement. Ejection canisters should be positioned parallel inside the airframe. So that means that the, the open end of the deployment of the charge should be facing in a direction that you want the charge to, uh, to deploy out. Do not place the ejection charge sideways because you could end up blowing a hole on the side or uh, lack of uh, pressure. When the, when the charge fires, the force of the charge goes out on the open end or the end that you taped. The other, end, the other end is generally uh, uh, has uh, some kind of glue or, or um, glue or tape on the other end. Okay, Bill, go ahead with the shear pins. We're going to go on to the shear pins. And the shear pins are, and the shear pins are just, they're small nylon screws. They're about a 440 screw, 5, 5 16 inch screw. On the rockets you guys are using, they, they should hold in place with two to three shear pins. If you put additional weight in your nose cone to make the rocket stable, you're gonna need additional shear pins with it. The reason for that is if, when your drogue chute opens, the body tube and the nose cone continue to move at the same speed. When it stops, the body tube stops, the nose cone still keeps moving. If there's not shear pins in your rocket, the nose cone's gonna come out at apogee and you're going to have a long walk to recover your rocket because of the inertia of the nose cone. 
So to look to do that, one of the things that I always like to do is I put a marking on the body tube and a line on the nose cone. And then I slide it in, I line those two lines up. The reason for that is, is that those holes are gonna be a little bit off. And when I wanna go refly the rocket, if I line those lines up, my, my shear pin holes match up perfectly each time. So we're ready to go on to the next one. The easiest way to do this is to cut a sheet of paper to the circumference of the body tube. If you want two shear pins in, fold it in half. If you want three shear pins in, fold into thirds. If you want four in, fold into fourths. Then you're gonna take and tape it onto the body tube of the rocket. Make sure that the sheet of paper is also taped onto the body of the rocket so it does not move. You're gonna drill, you're gonna drill a hole, marking up with each fold point. But the other thing I like to do is mark where the markings are at. Because if you use more than one sheet of paper, sometimes it's easy to make a mistake as to where you're drilling. So you're gonna drill in with a, either a 1 16th or a 5 64th inch drill bit. Start with the 1 16th. If that's too small, go to the 5 64th. All right, then once I've drilled the hole, I'm gonna stick the shear pin into it, lock in place. The first hole, make sure you use a shear pin and it's placed in because if you don't do that, the nose cone's gonna rotate and then none of your holes are gonna match up. So it's really important that you put that one in, then drill your other one or two shear pins in and you're set. Okay, if you're gonna go with a nose cone dual deployed, last one's for a standard dual deploy, it's a little bit different. You're gonna cut the sheet of paper like before, fold it in half for two shear pins or fold in the thirds for three. But this is gonna line up on the nose cone itself in order to put it in. It does not go into the bot, into that centering ring, which, which you see below the rocket. So you're gonna drill the holes into the nose cone. So you, again, you mark it like before, you go about a half inch up, drill the hole in, put the shear pin in, and then go about and drill your other holes. So you insert the shear pin in. Uh, when you do that, make sure you do that with the first one so that it does not rotate. And you can, uh, once you get that pin in, you can drill your other holes. Okay, prepping the rocket. Prepping the rocket is uh, most essential, of course. Uh, when building the rocket, do not block off the area above the uh, motor uh, for more if you're using motor rejection. Um, if you have some kind of uh, extra eBay in there or some kind of payload in there, it's gonna interfere uh, with the uh, ejection charge. So the airframe above, above the motor must be open or clear uh, as shown on the uh, photo on the left. The photo on the right shows the uh, coiling the cord and wrap it with two layers of masking tape. This stops the cord and chute tangling and slows down the apogee velocity as it deploys at apogee. Uh, it's a very good uh, uh, system to use when you have uh, a long cord that's uh, five times or five times longer than the airframe or uh, longer. Uh, it can fit nicely inside the uh, booster section. And as it uh, stretches out, it's got less stress on your, uh, on your uh, bulkheads and the strap, of course. Let's see slide 37, uh, cellulose insulation is very important, otherwise known as rocketry uh, in the circles of dog barf. Uh, place a few inches of cellulose insulation on the top of the motor or as needed. Slide 38, install a remaining recovery cord bundle as shown in the, uh, on the left into the airframe. Place a chute in the airframe as shown on the right. Uh, the chute quick link is also a good place to attach the radio tracker or personal alarm, alarm systems, uh, which is uh, up by the uh, parachute connection and the uh, chute protector connection. 39, the coiler recovery cord that gives, uh, give it two wraps of masking tape around the cord. The uh, long end of recovery cord is attached to the eBay and the short end is running through the airframe and attaches to the nose cone. Uh, attach 
attach a rolled up chute to the quick link. This is uh, when you're uh, doing your payload section as shown in the picture on the left and the right. Slide 40, attach the quick link from the long section of the cord to the eBay. Number two, place the remaining cord and shoot into the payload section. After you get that all done, uh, place a few inches of uh, cellulose insulation in, into the airframe where the eBay attaches and place the ejecting charges in the insulation parallel with the airframe. Prepping the rock. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Right. And then the slides are, are missing there, but you also then need to take the, the eBay and insert it into the, the body tube and then use your rivets or screws to hold that in place. Then on to the next section with your nose cone, you line up your line that you put on the nose cone, you line it up with the mark in the body tube, you slide it in, and then you start putting shear pins in, two or three or whatever that you're using for it. I guess I, then, then this is showing you attaching the, the eBay to it. So I kind of jumped ahead with that. So you attach the recovery cord to the, to the booster from the eBay and you insert the eBay section into the booster section of the rocket. When you put the rocket together, one of the problems you have with rockets is that they're loose and they go up with the motor. When they go up, the rocket will shake itself loose in particular when burnout happens. So if the rocket is not tightly put together, you're gonna to shake it apart. And the way you're gonna test for that is you insert the, the eBay into the booster section and you lift up. If the rocket opens up, it slides apart, it's too loose and it'll shake apart. And what you're gonna to do to fix that is you're gonna run vertical strips of masking tape up and down the eBay of it. You put it back in and you do that and you keep adding the strips of tape until when you lift on the rocket, the rocket stays together. Failure to do that is gonna result in a rocket flying open on its way up and that's a very bad thing to have happen. You also wanna double check and make sure you have bent holes. Make sure you have vent holes on both the booster section and on the payload section. The reason why you want vent holes is, is that as you go up, the pressure of the gases that are surrounding the rocket become much lower. That causes the volume of the gas inside the rocket to increase. And with that increase, the gas will go out the vent holes. If you don't do that, the, the increase in volume will open up your rocket on the way up. Okay, we're ready for the next one. Tracking your rocket. You want to take that, Frank, or should I? Uh, go ahead. All right. Let's go on to the tracking the rocket. One of the things, if, you, if you're not using radio tracking or using GPS tracking, personal alarm sirens are extremely helpful. You could get those in a Walmart. You can get those in most stores. They're probably on your campuses. They're the little alarms you carry. If you're in trouble, you pull the pin out, and it puts out a real loud alarm. What you're gonna do with that is tape it to your shock cord, hook it to your parachute quick link, and when the rocket opens up, it will pull the pin out and it will make a really loud sound. The other thing I would tell you with the personal alarm sirens is replace the batteries before you fly it. You're gonna find out that people love to pull those while they're sitting around in the lab, they go through, and what ends up happening is you don't have enough battery left. So it's a good idea to replace your batteries before you do it. When a rocket lands, pick a landmark, a tree, something that lines up with you and your rocket. I'd also recommend, because it's easy to draw in the, in the ground there, draw an arrow pointing right at it. That helps in case you have to go back to the beginning, restart the rocket, you have a point. I'd also recommend you keep somebody at that point so they could see where you are and where your point is. That way, if you start wandering off and as you walk through fields, you tend to wander off that line, they can give you a call and tell you to get back on in line. Another thing that's really helpful is a compass. You can get either a personal or a compass, or you can look with things, for example, you have them on your phone. When you take a look, get a mark of it, 
follow the compass line. The compass line will keep you in line to where you're going. It's amazing how easy it is to wand off, wander off track. Another thing which is extremely helpful, take pictures of the rocket while it lands. You can pull those pictures back up as you get closer to that area. You can see exactly where it's come down at. And that can quite often help you find the rocket by knowing where it's landed at. And on the left, you'll see there's several examples of personal alarm sirens. Frank, you also, you're going to have pretty, you might have a few members of your uh, rocket team uh, to observe where the rocket landed if they're out in the field uh, uh, getting the rocket or marking the rocket where it's at. Always communicate. Yeah. And that's my rocket retriever, Emma. When I first got her at about two months, I started showing her rocket videos, getting used to the sound. She would jump off the chair and go and try to retrieve the rockets. So I call her my rocket retriever, and I had to put a picture of her in. Anybody have any questions? I, uh, I love that last picture, Bill. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I thought it was awesome. Um, so at this point, um, we are going, you know, I want to thank both of you, Frank and Bill, um, for the presentation. It was very informative um, and lots of good stuff in there. And uh, I look forward to having this on our um, on our website and available for all of our teams to be able to use as a great resource. So thank you very much. Um, is there anything that you guys want to add uh, as we conclude tonight's presentation? Nope, I'm good. Yep, and I'm good here too. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And um, I am going to stop the recording and in just as soon as I find that.